Good evening, and let me extend my deepest thanks to those of you who are banging the fork on the glass that, that usually works in calming the crowd. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Koch, and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to the silver anniversary celebration of the National School of Law's annual recognition dinner. Uh, this dinner uh, was the brainchild of one of our board members, Doug Fisher, uh, 25 years ago had the idea, why don't we get some friends together and celebrate the school? I believe Doug has been to all 25 dinners and he's here tonight. And Doug, if you'd stand, we'd like to thank you for what you've done. Now, when I succeeded Joe Loser as dean of the school, uh, Joe gave me some advice. One piece of advice was never let the commencement go for more than an hour. And the second was don't have a long after dinner program. So we are mindful of Joe's advice and that's what we're going to do tonight. We will, we will have a a good after dinner program, but it will not be long. I feel also obligated to tell you that the bar will remain open. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> no, the bar, the bar will remain open and we are just so thrilled that you are here to celebrate this occasion with us, to celebrate the school, the achievements of our students, uh, the, the future of the bench and bar in Tennessee, thank you. We're going to begin the evening as we always do with an invocation and Judge Frank Clement is gonna give the invocation tonight. Thank you, Dean, and please bow your heads. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of the hearts of all of us in this place be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Yours is the voice that we need to hear. Above all the other voices of our culture that send us false messages about who we are and who others are, help us stay close to you. Deepen within us our love for you and our neighbor that we might sing a song of love for the loveless, hope for the hopeless, and joy for the joyless. Being thankful of everything that you have provided for us, in thy name we pray, amen. Please enjoy your dinner and we will be back when dessert starts getting served with the program. from the school uh, for uh, as an alumnus or alumna, as a teacher or as a community service award. If at the end of the program tonight, if you would come forward for some group pictures, we would appreciate that because we want to memorialize that event. Uh, the bar in the back, by the way, is still open. Uh, thank you. And as we begin the program, uh, if I could pause just for a minute to thank all the hardworking hands and heads who put this meal together. If our staff would stand up in the back. And I have to tell you that there is no better partner for an enterprise like this than the Renaissance Hotel. So we are grateful to the Renaissance for their help with our meal uh, every year and also with our graduations. Uh, that is an unsolicited plug. If you're looking for an event, check out the Renaissance. Okay. Our dinner is called a recognition dinner for a reason. It's because we like to recognize people and their contributions. 
And so what I'm going to be doing here for the next few minutes is recognizing people who have been very significant in the life of the school, and then I will proceed to our two honorees for tonight. Our school's success rests on the dedication and commitment of the members of our Board of Trustees. And we are very delighted that four of them are joining us tonight. And I'm going to call out your names. And the board usually doesn't do what I ask them to do, but perhaps tonight they will stand up to be recognized. Aubrey Harwell, our current board chair. Thank you. Tom Cohn, who is the foundation on which our school's built. Tom, thank you so much. Judge Frank Clement, who and John Rochford. And of course, tonight, as we did at graduation two weeks ago, we finally remember our colleague and member of the board, Justice Frank Drawoda, who we recently lost. His support of our school and the students has been truly inspirational, and we remember him tonight as well. Uh, our school uh, exists by the good graces of the Tennessee Supreme Court and the Board of Law Examiners. I remind myself of that every day when I come to work. And we are very fortunate tonight to have all five members of the Supreme Court with us. So if Chief Justice Jeff Bivens, Justice Connie Clark, Justice Sharon Lee, Justice Holly Kirby, and Justice Roger Page, if you all will stand, let us thank you. And as I've mentioned before, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary of this dinner tonight. And I am delighted to announce to you that we have broken all records in terms of fundraising for this event. And so I want to thank each of you for your generosity. Tonight's event is the most successful we've ever had. I would particularly like to acknowledge and thank our leadership givers, Charlotte and Tom Cohn, Brenda and Doug Hale, Carol and John Rochford, and Mary Frances Rudy. They have led the way this year. Our Dean's Council supporters, uh, uh, rank, uh, among them ranks of the firm of Neil and Harwell, so thank you to Neil and Harwell. Our sustaining benefactors are the law firm of Burr and Foreman, the Maddox Foundation, and Marlene and Bob Moses. Thank you. Very much. And then our law school advocates, DVL Sigenthaler, Equitable Trust, Judge Mark Fishburne and Laura Dykes, Lowry, Lowry, and Cherry, Charles R. Newald, who you will hear more about later. Ann and Joe Russell, and Larry R. Williams. Thank you to them. The driving wheel behind these dinner, dinners are our traditional table sponsors who sponsor tables every year. We have 29 table sponsors tonight. Uh, I do not have time to name all the names, but if the table sponsors would stand, we'd like to thank you too. Now, the purpose of this dinner over the years has been to lift up and honor our graduates who have distinguished themselves in the practice of law or on the bench, to recognize the members of our magnificent faculty who have prepared our graduates for success in their chosen fields, and to celebrate other women and men who have made significant contributions to our community. We have included photos and a brief biological sketch of all these honorees in your program. 
and I hope you will take the program home and, and look at the people who have been involved in this school's life and celebrate with us how well they've done. I've already reminded you honorees before it goes to your head to please come front at the end of the meeting so we can get a group picture of all of you. Since 1994, 35 of our graduates have received our distinguished alumni recognition. And with those of you who are here tonight, stand so we can recognize you, our, gra our graduates. I know you're here. <laughs> Similarly, we have, we have recognized and honored 31 members of our faculty, and I would appreciate the current and former faculty members who have received this recognition to stand and be recognized. Faculty members. We do not bestow our Community Service Award every year, and in fact, uh, we have awarded the Community Service Award only six times in the past 25 years. One of them has joined us tonight, and so I would appreciate it if Aubrey Harwell would stand to be recognized. It's now time to present the Faculty Award. To say that David Hudson knows the First Amendment is like saying the sky is blue. He's known across the country as an expert in student speech issues, and he teaches his students with the same fervor and commitment that he defends the Constitution. David's expertise in the First Amendment has been a tremendous asset to the school and to our students. But David's humility, approachable nature, and desire for others to know and embrace the study of law the way he does sets him apart from the rest. And it's for that reason we are recognizing him tonight. David graduated from Duke University and earned his law degree at Vanderbilt Law School. Davidson County Juvenile Court Judge Sheila Calloway, one of David's classmates at Vanderbilt, recalls that they used to tease each other about being the two least likely to succeed. <laughs> With all deference to Judge Calloway, uh, they are both wrong. Both of them have succeeded. David clerked for Davidson County Circuit Court Judge Marietta Shipley, and just prior to joining our school, he served as senior law clerk to Tennessee Supreme Court Justice Sharon Lee, who joins us tonight to honor David's accomplishments. For many years, David was the staff attorney at Vanderbilt University's First Amendment Center, and he continues to serve at the Museum Institute's First Amendment Fellow. He speaks nationally on First Amendment issues and is a prolific writer. He has authored more than 40 volumes on various areas of law and life and has written countless articles that have appeared in the ABA Law Journal, bar periodicals, law reviews, and other publications. He is also a frequent CLE presenter. David has taught at the Southeastern Paralegal Institute MTSU, Vanderbilt Law School, and Belmont University College of Law. He also lectures for Barbary. David began teaching at the National School of Law in 2005 and joined the administrative staff as Director of Academic Affairs in December of 2014. He has taught both introductory and advanced legal research and writing, Tennessee constitutional law, advanced legal studies, the Bar Exam Workshop, and of course, First Amendment Law. He also administers the school's rigorous writing program that launched this year. Nary a student makes it through the Nashville School of Law without encountering David in at least one class, something that benefits the students greatly. He has twice been selected to give the commencement address at graduation. Last year, he testified before the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitution and Civil Justice regarding First Amendment protections of public college university campuses. 
At that hearing, Tennessee Congressman Steve Cohen complimented David on his ability to cite cases and quote specifics from memory, quipping, I don't even see your teleprompter. Of course, there was no teleprompter. But Representative Cohen is not the only person to reference David's encyclopedic knowledge of the First Amendment and its related cases. David's current colleague, Jean Polisinski, a former student at the National School of Law, who is now the Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute and the Institute's First Amendment Center in Washington, recalls a presentation that they both made several years ago where an audience member noted with some bravado that a particular case that David had cited contained language inconsistent with the point that David had just made. David politely replied that if the audience member were to advance about a page and a half in the opinion and look at the bottom paragraph on the page, uh, they would find the authoring justice statement that he had quoted. Uh, the uh, audience member mentioned that not even part, uh, that, uh, that had not even been part of David's prepared remarks. Uh, he had not prepared for that. He's just that good. His students say that David's passion for his work translates to compassion in the classroom. For some of us administrators, that sounds like he's an easy grader. I, I don't think that's really the case. Despite his knowledge and intelligence, David maintains what's been described as a selfless sense of sincerity. He really connects with the students in the classroom. He educates from a position of erudite authority without talking down to anybody. As one student put it, in legal education, you sometimes get puzzles and you must unravel the important information from the irrelevant information. David pulls back the curtain of knowledge and as the student said, he has done the work for you so that you can concentrate on learning. Although his vast knowledge could and actually does fill many volumes, David continues to demonstrate a thirst for learning, another characteristic that resonates with his students. He knows that there may very well be more to learn, more to discover, and he is always on the lookout for the next piece of wisdom and understanding which he will surely pass on to his students. Beyond his intellect and passion for teaching, David is a well-rounded individual enjoying time with friends and entertaining them with his delightful sense of humor. As Jean Polisensky has observed, David can drop back from the professional work, something that's rare for one who is so laser focused on a heady topic such as First Amendment law. It is hardly no surprise that David has expertise in areas beyond the law. He is a fan of many sports and has written books about boxing, horse racing, golf, and basketball. He is a licensed judge and ringside announcer for boxing and martial art events and travels the world doing that. He knows his way around the tennis court, so I've heard, and you may think twice before challenging him, challenging him to a game of ping pong. We hear he's pretty good. In fact, he tells us that he's really good. You are also likely to find him on the hardwood shooting hoops with law students and fellow attorneys. David, who is a native of Murfreesboro, lives in Nashville with his wife, Carla, and I happen to know that David just celebrated his birthday yesterday. David's contributions to the school cannot be overstated. He has personally touched the lives of hundreds of students, and he has shepherded them to successful careers on the bench and the bar. His affable nature and generous spirit have endeared him uh, to many personally and professionally. David is very fond of borrowing a line from Benjamin Franklin. He cautions his students, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. David, you have prepared yourself, and you have helped our students prepare themselves by providing them the tools to be successful in the study of law and beyond. It is our privilege tonight to recognize you as the 2018 Nashville School of Law Faculty Honoree, and we invite you to the stage for a few remarks.
Ooh. I wonder if I can follow that introduction. Thank you so much, Dean Koch. Thank you to the board. Um, thanks to all my former students that are here. Thank you to my parents, David and Carol Hudson. Thank you to my beautiful wife, Carla. Uh, it's really one of the greatest honors of my life. I think back to uh, June 19, 2005. I was sitting ringside at the FedEx Forum for the World Light Heavyweight Championship rematch between Antonio Tarver and Glenn Johnson. And it was my first world title fight. I was nervous. I was on HBO. I knew there were about 20,000 people in the stands, millions watching worldwide. And I thought to myself, what am I doing here? Uh, up to that time, all I'd ever done was judge club shows at the Music City Mix Factory, the Gallatin Civic Center, <laughs> the Armory, a high school gymnasium in Columbia that had no air conditioning. <laughs> and here I was at, uh, at the pinnacle of uh, boxing. And the fight was very close, and it gets to about the 10th or 11th round. And they show a picture of all three judges. And I was judging with a man named John Rupert, who had judged about a dozen world title fights. Uh, Rocky Young, who I believe, had judged about eight world title fights. And of course, I had not judged a single world title fight. And so Jim Lampley proceeds to look at each person's picture. John Rupert is a very experienced judge. He'll do a good job. Rocky Young has, has at least been on this stage before. David Hudson. Well, it's obvious Mr. Hudson has no big time fight experience. We'll have to look at his court scorecard very closely. Uh, fight ends, they announce the scores 116, 112, 116, 112, 115, 113, unanimous decision for Antonio Tarver. So I'm leaving the stage, Harold Letterman who's HBO's unofficial ringside scorer, he actually judged Muhammad Ali's third fight with Ken Norton, pulls open his page and he says his scorecard, 116-112, welcome to HBO. And that was a good moment for me. <laughs> I mention that because my career in boxing judging has some interesting parallels with my teaching career. And in fact, 2005 was a good year because about a month later, I was driving to the rec center at Vanderbilt, and I received a call from Beth McDonald. About four years prior, I had sent a resume in to uh, teach at the National School of Law, and, and I didn't hear anything. And honestly, I'd forgotten about it. Uh, and Dean McDonald said, uh, Dean Loser would like you to come to speak with him about possibly teaching legal writing. And so I got to go to the school, talk to Dean Loser, Dean Townsend, and they, they hired me to be one of the legal research and writing instructors. And much like boxing, um, I had taught, but I had not taught at a law school. And in fact, I never imagined that I would ever teach law school. Ask, ask Judge Calloway. Uh, <laughs> I was just not a very good law student, um, particularly that first year. I was intimidated. It was a new language. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing. And uh, thank God my father convinced me to, to stay in school, pushed me. I, many things I owe him, but definitely that. He convinced me to stay in law school. Um, I had started my teaching career at Southeastern Paralegal Institute, as, as Dean Koch said. Um, one of my former students, I believe, is here tonight, Danielle Giannotti. I remember her referring to me as uh, rebel without a clue, I think was her <laughs> phrase. Um, I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but they gave me a lot of classes, and I got some experience. And then I taught at Middle Tennessee State University, and then the great honor of my career, I think, the, uh, it has been to teach at the National School of Law. There's a book about the National School of Law called Profiles of Tenacity, and it's a very apt title. The most rewarding thing for me at the National School of Law 
has been many of the students and friendships that I have developed from, from former students. I'd like to mention uh, just a few. I don't mean to leave anyone out, but the thing about the student body at the National School of Law, as you all know, is they come from such different backgrounds, police officers, firefighters, public school teachers, business owners, doctors. And there are two gentlemen who I taught who were in their late 60s, early 70s when they started law school. I believe they're both here tonight, Jim Edwards and Bill Spaniard. Look, I had tremendous trouble in law school in my 20s. And these men, decades later, come back to law school and, and both graduate. Well, that's character. I think about many of the writers that I've taught. I started teaching at National School of Law, teaching writing class, and I've had many beautiful writers. Uh, Judge Clement's senior law clerk, Emily Harvey, was a magnificent writer. In fact, I've, I've gotten to co-author several pieces with her. I'm very proud of that. But in 2000, uh, about 2011, I vividly remember a third-year law student come up to me. Um, I didn't know how to pronounce her last name, but I, I knew that she did good work. Michelle Wojcikowski, I think was her name. And she came up and she said, uh, there's this job at the administrative office of the courts, helping out the courts. Do you think I would be qualified for that? I said, yes, I think you would. Um, I think you'd do a great job. I think they'd be lucky to have you. If you ask Chief Justice Bivens and the other justices, I think she did a, she did a good job there, right? Until Dean, Dean Coke took her away uh, yeah. to the school. There are many students I've taught who have completely started over in terms of careers. My friend B.J. Goss is here. This is a man who was nominated for four Grammys for, for producing gospel music, winning two of them. He gives up that career to come back and teach at the National School of Law. I've taught some brilliant people. I've taught at, at multiple law schools. And I'll tell you, there's one fella who was so smart it was scary. I believe he's here, Robert Allen Dalton. Um, are you here, Rob? You are here somewhere. <laughs> he was so smart. I, I could not fathom how smart this man was. Uh, and it's been a great pleasure to be able to, to do a few cases with him. And there's so many more students. I, can't, I, I, I hate to mention some and leave people out. It's just been a, a wonderful experience. When I first joined the faculty, I also felt like I was out of place because there were all these distinguished jurists and famous attorneys, and here I was. Um, I felt like the one, you know, where the circle, the one that doesn't fit. I felt like that, but uh, they were all very acclimating, and I learned to em emulate, or at least hope to emulate, some of their uh, teaching prowess, the consistency and discipline of Judge Marshall Davidson. Uh, the caring compassion of Bill Harbison, who teaches contracts. The love of history and the discipline and dedication of Dean William Koch. And the master craftsmanship and the interaction with students of Judge Mark Fishburne. All those individuals and many more I was, I was grateful to, uh, to learn from. I also want to thank some people that I was able to uh, do, some, do some law with through the years. Early in my career, after, after clerking with Judge Shipley, I went over to the uh, First Amendment Center and uh, for many years was, was mainly a legal journalist. But I got to work with two attorneys in Murfreesboro I have the utmost respect with. In fact, they're sitting at my father's table, Steve Waldron and Terry Fan. And I got to work in a lot of uh, employment discrimination cases, uh, civil rights cases. Uh, they are consummate professionals, and I hope I've, I've learned something from them along the way. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the influence of John Sigenthaler Sr. He's not with us anymore, 
but he's a constant presence in my life and that of my wife's. Not only did he teach me about the First Amendment, gave me a job for 17 and a half years, uh, but he did things like when my electricity got cut off, he actually gave me, uh, gave me money to turn my lights back on. <laughs> when he turned 80 years old, I wrote him a poem entitled The Contrarian Octogenarian. <laughs> but I also, at the end of it, thanked him for, for, for helping me out. There are other people I, I, I want to thank as well. Um, you know, I started my career as a, as a trial court clerk, uh, and I, I struggle with that. I love Judge Shipley. I don't know if she's here. I know she's come to some of these in the past, but uh, I tried my best there. Uh, but my second day on the job, I broke the court's television, which was a problem because there was only one television for all five judges, so she... Got off to a rocky start, but uh, made it through the clerkship. But years later, I got to clerk at the Tennessee Supreme Court uh, for Justice Sharon Lee. Uh, and I just love her. Uh, I love her uh, passion for the underdog. I love her commitment. I love her work ethic. And I think it increased my uh, attention to detail, which is something I still need to work on. But uh, I just loved working for her and getting to know a lot of the other jurists on the on the Tennessee Supreme Court. I also want to thank my parents, um, David and, and Carol Hudson. I uh, obviously wouldn't be here without them. They're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, I believe, later this year. I don't know the exact date. Um, my, uh, my mother was always there for me. Um, I remember some kids used to uh, pejoratively refer to me as a mama's boy. I said, yes, yes, I am. Still am. Love my mama. Um, and my, uh, my father has always been my hero. Um, he came up from a very, very difficult childhood. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how he made it. Uh, but he made it through sheer hard work and determination. And whatever good work ethic I, I have, I think I inherited from him. And I, I love him dearly. And then I'd like to thank my wife, uh, Carla. Uh, we've been married a while now. And uh, I have a few idiosyncrasies, peccadilloes, and uh, she not only tolerates them, but m most of the time she embraces them. And what I really want to thank her for is that I have been very selfish at times. I have taught up to three nights a week at the National School of Law to, to 10 p.m. Um, she never complained. Maybe she just wanted me out of the house. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I've also been very selfish with writing. It, it takes a certain selfishness to close yourself off and, and, and write more than 40 books. Um, and, and she never complained on that. What I, what I most appreciate is the loyalty. There was a time I was falling behind on a book. We had to write the index and a bunch of tables for a book on the US Supreme Court. And people don't know this, but she stayed up with me 36 straight hours to finish that book and submit it to the publisher. So, thank you. I love this school, and I, I love the staff of the school. Every single person that works at that school is a great person. Um, I, I don't have the cleanest office. Um, I, I've got some foibles there, but they've all tolerated me uh, very well, and I, I love each and every one of them. I love this school very much. I, I love teaching at this school. Uh, to use the boxing analogy, you know, I, I'd like to keep teaching until they count to 10. I thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. This is one of the greatest honors, probably the greatest honor I've ever received. Thank you very much.
And for those of you that have just heard, have just heard David's stentorian voice, he is also an essential ingredient at our graduations because he calls out the names of the graduates before they come out on the stage. He pronounces their names perfectly, and when he leans into that microphone, it sounds like God is calling. <laughs> so, and the closest I've ever seen to that level of service is at Cumberland University, where they use the Nashville Predators announcer to call their program. <laughs> so, so thank you, David. In 1911, two seemingly unrelated events occurred nearly 1,000 miles apart. One, as most of us in the room should know, was the founding of our school. The other was the founding of a small West Texas town named Rawls. How, you might wonder, could these two events be related? Well, the founder of Rawls, Texas, just happens to be the great-grandfather of tonight's alumni honoree, Charles Rawls Newald. Now, I'm going to refer to him as Charlie. I think he prefers that. So Charlie's roots are in the Texas-Mexican border near El Paso. He arrived in Nashville to attend Vanderbilt University as an undergrad. And while there, he fell in with a fast crowd of NSL graduates. And following his graduation from Vanderbilt, he decided to enroll in our school. Charlie earned his law degree in 1984 and has been a significant member of Nashville's legal community ever since. Charlie prefers to work behind the scenes out of the limelight. He is more comfortable giving rather than receiving recognition. However, during this celebration of the 25th anniversary of this dinner, we have chosen to shine the light on Charlie because it is his long dedication to the dinner that has made it the success it is. He chairs the event every year. <laughs> Although he was temporarily relieved of that responsibility this year, Temporarily, Charlie, <laughs> temporarily. Uh, he attends to all the details down to the piano player. He greets the guests. He makes sure the tables look right. Our dinner has become the largest social gathering of lawyers and judges in Tennessee because in no small measure, Charlie's been involved. Now, the law runs deep in the Newald family. Charlie and his far better half, Laura Goodall Newald, met while students at the National School of Law. Our strict confidentiality rules prevent me from comparing their academic success. <laughs> they married shortly after their graduation. Laura's and Charlie's daughter, Ann Rawls Newald, practices law in Nashville with States and Harbison after graduating from the Belmont University College of Law. And Charlie's father-in-law, Robert H. Goodall, is also a graduate of our school and was an alumni honoree at this dinner just three years ago. All of them are with us tonight, and we welcome you all. It would be difficult for me to overstate Charlie's commitment to the practice of law and to his clients. He is in his office on 2nd Avenue seven days a week and has two paralegals who work overtime to keep up with him. But for Charlie, practicing law is far more than just ledgering up billable hours. He has a dogged devotion to his clients and to their causes. His work schedule reflects his commitment to serve his clients when it is most convenient for them. He speaks passionately about their need to find relief and about justice being served in their cases. He takes his obligation to them seriously and expresses heartfelt concern for the poor working conditions and unreasonable practices that his clients often encounter. 
These circumstances motivate his efforts to zealously represent his clients, and he does that quite well. Charlie credits the lawyers who mentored, mentored him for showing him how to be a true professional. We are all familiar with names such as Bill Underhill for workers' comp, John Nolan for medical malpractice, Norman Lane for auto accident cases, and Ogden Stokes for bond work. Beyond Tennessee, Charlie's approach to the law has been shaped by Bob Cartwright of San Francisco, Peter Perlman of Lexington, Kentucky, Scotty Bowen from Texas, and Lenny Ring from Chicago. Summing it all up, Charlie says that he has been fortunate to meet and work with some of the great trial lawyers in the United States. Charlie also credits his success with his close-knit law school class of 1984. Nearly all the students who began the school graduated together. Charlie attributes this success to a fellow classmate who transcribed the lectures for each class and then sold them, we call them verbatims, to his classmates for a small fee. Many of Charlie's fellow classmates benefited by these verbatims as well, and they're here tonight to wish Charlie well. Laura attributes Charlie's success to his superb organizational skills. She recalls that one of Charlie's colleagues once quipped that he would be quite capable of single-handedly running the United Nations. Fortunately for Laura, those organizational skills spill over to his home life as well, and she speaks from the heart when she talks about what a hard worker Charlie is, giving it all for his clients and his family to make a better life for them all. Despite his, voc his devotion to his vocation, Charlie does allow himself a few weeks off for vacation every year. He takes these vacations very seriously and travels to exotic and far off destinations. He recently visited Antarctica and kayaked among the whales and penguins around the South Pole. He makes every effort not to visit the same place more than once. He's been to Machu Picchu, Hong Kong, Cambodia, Ho Chi Minh City, just to name a few. And as a matter of fact, he's leaving this coming Monday for a European trip that includes Russia, Norway, Denmark, and Estonia. Back here at home, Charlie and Laura are very active in the community and support a wide variety of worthy causes. He is also an usher and greeter at the West End United Methodist Church. Charlie has worked hard to earn his impeccable reputation. Actually, as Charlie notes to realtors, it's location, location, location. For lawyers, it's reputation, reputation, reputation. Charlie, we applaud you tonight for your devoted commitment to your clients, for your leadership in the life of the National School of Law and its students, and for your commitment to Nashville and Middle Tennessee. It is my privilege to present to you the Alumni of the Year Award and to invite you to the podium for a few words. Thank you, Dean Koch, for those kind words, the board, and especially for all of you who have attended the dinner tonight and uh, hopefully will attend in the future uh, by giving your time, support, and funds. Um, I want to thank my parents for sending me uh, to school outside of Texas. I wanted to go to SMU, but they made me go to Vanderbilt, and I'm glad that they did. Um, I've enjoyed thoroughly um, living in Tennessee and practicing law in this state. Um, when I first came here, my senior year at Vanderbilt, I fell in with um, some trial lawyers, and they had a firm over on 3rd Avenue North, uh, and it was Lester, Loser, Hildebrand, Nolan, Lane, Mondelli, Porter, and Dewar, and then finally, Neewald came on the, the board. I remember that quite vividly, but uh, I enjoyed um, 
the National School of Law, and Harry Lester, who was a judge in the Second Circuit, Nixon had beat him in a, uh, in a, in a or he had beat uh, Judge Nixon, and then he was on the Second Circuit Court, but he was instrumental in me going to the National School of Law, and I always do appreciate that. The first night I was there, I met my wife, and um, Laura Goodall, and uh, she was sitting over in a room uh, that I think there was maybe 80 or 90 of us in the class, and I noticed she had a Vanderbilt bag, big black bag with Vanderbilt written on it, and I kind of sat over next to her, and I thought, um, I said, did you go to Vanderbilt? And she goes, no. And I said, well, you have a Vanderbilt bag. I thought, that good looking, I would have known her. Vanderbilt was not that big back in the 70s. And she went to Ole Miss. So we all went through school. And Ann Russell, um, you know, we, we just had a great class. And one of the benefits that Harry Lester had told me was, look, he called me Charlie, my boy, but he would say, you can go work and come do things, you know, at the office, but then you can go to school at night. And I thought, gosh, that's, you know, a long time to go, four years, that kind of thing, but it all went so quick. Back then, uh, I was so fortunate to have uh, mentors, which I think is so important, you know, for young lawyers to have our uh, different people. And in our particular office, everyone was almost 10 years apart. Um, and so a lot of people, they were fortunate when they, their tenure really had um, gone with the firm. They'd gone and Harry Lester went on the bench, Les Mondelli, um, Joe Loser, who uh, was a, a great mentor also, um, went on the bench. And so it's just been a, a nice recycling uh, of the lawyers and I feel very fortunate that uh, I got that opportunity at the National School of Law and then with the uh, lawyers that I practice with. So I want to thank you again and I hope you all all have a good evening. Shakespeare said our revels are at an end. Again, please accept my thanks on behalf of my colleagues and staff at the National School of Law for spending your evening with us. Uh, please remember that the current and past honorees, if you would come forward for your school picture, we, we would appreciate that. The bar will remain open for <laughs> a period of time after. Uh, I wish you Godspeed. I look forward to seeing you next year, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.